scary stories. I live in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains in northeast Georgia. It's a beautiful area with hundreds of miles of natural forest, some great state parks, and a ton of fantastic camping places. Unfortunately, my hometown is also relatively poor. While there are some out-of-town residents from Atlanta and other places, a lot of people where I live are really poor. I do freelance work as a technical writer, so I can do most of my work online. If I did not have that going for me, I'd have to move somewhere else. It's just one of those small towns that will rob you of your ability to accomplish anything in life if you stay there too long. Excluding a handful of doctors and lawyers and Georgia Power Company employees, the only employment in the area is at Walmart, fast food, and a couple of grocery stores. To the east of my town, there is a massive national park. It's loaded with great camping sites and lots of relatively unused hiking trails. I really enjoy hiking on them with my dog, but it can be a bit of an unnerving experience sometimes. It's about a 10 mile drive from town, and there's no cell phone service or homes for miles. In the past, there have been a lot of vehicle break-ins at the trailheads. The gravel parking lots had some of them glitter with bits of broken glass from what I'm guessing were car windows. Sometimes there are really shifty people hanging around these trailheads or just driving around on the forest service roads. These are really rough roads and you'll see these beat up $500 cars just barreling along roads meant for a 4x4. Some of the people you see in the cars look like the guy that got crushed by an ATM in Breaking Bad. All of that being said, it's a great place to camp, however, you just have to be careful. A few years ago, two of my friends and I decided to go play paintball in the National Forest. We decided to turn the paintball expedition into a camping trip so we could play the next morning too. After a pretty uneventful day of shooting paintball at each other, we drive a couple of miles to one of the more popular camping spots. Unfortunately, a church group or something had taken up all of the spots in the area. This was really the only camping spot that we were familiar with. It was getting pretty late. We decided to keep on looking, so we drive for about half an hour further and further into the woods. By this time, it's getting a bit dark, and we're getting a bit worried about finding a spot. We all had GPS on our smartphones, but none of us had any service. We turn off onto an unfamiliar road that isn't in very good shape. In fact, it looks like the Forest Service Rangers used a backhoe to block off the road with a mound of dirt. A broken metal barrier lay in the woods nearby. That said, it looked like 4x4 vehicles had been going over the mound, so it was pretty worn down. Our F-150 had pretty high clearance, so we decided to go over the mound. There was an old gravel road on the other side, and the road was pretty much clear of debris. We drove a few miles down this road and came across an opening next to a small creek. There were some blue tarps hanging over a plywood table nailed to a tree, which seemed kind of odd. That said, it was pretty much dark at this point, and we did not want to keep driving around all night looking for a camping spot. We left the truck running and we set up the tent. As we were setting up the tent, I started to notice that there was a lot of trash in the woods surrounding the site. I see a green bottle laying on the ground. I take a look at the label. I see that it's a bottle of some home and garden insecticide. I was really tired at the time, and I just thought that someone had been dumping their home garbage out there. And none of us thought that it was weird that someone would be dumping garbage in an area that is more than a half an hour from the nearest home. We set up camp, had some beers, and made chili from scratch. By this time, it was probably around 11 p.m. As we were eating, we noticed a faint glow from the other side of a nearby hill. At first, we thought it was moonlight filtering its way through the trees. However, the angles did not make any sense. It did not seem to be a bright light, and it was not moving. 
It was kind of like the glow that you see over a bright city. We could not see the light source itself, though. Since there was no other access roads in the area, we decided it wasn't other campers. The hill was about a quarter mile from our campsite, so we decided to go investigate. Under normal circumstances, I know I would not have done so, however, we all had a few rum and cokes in our stomachs, and two of us, Jacob and I, decided to take a look. My other friend, Isaac, decides to stay behind to pop some popcorn over the fire. We start walking towards the light source, and the situation gets even stranger. All the trees in the area have their bark knocked off in a circle around their trunks. We thought it could have been the work of a beaver that lived in the creek, but it seemed strange that a beaver would go around all these trees and just knock the bark off in a circle. Jacob and I start talking about the ghost beaver in pretty loud voices, probably due to our drunkenness. As we are almost to the top of the hill, Jacob tripped and yelled, Oh shit! A few seconds after he yelled, the light, whatever it was, went out. We look at each other and decide that maybe we don't need to see what the light was after all. We walk back in silence and keep looking back every few seconds. We decide to turn off our flashlights and just use the moonlight to get back to the campsite. When we get a couple of hundred feet from the campsite, I can see my other friend Isaac walking around the campsite. He was wearing a hooded coat that I hadn't seen him wearing before. For some reason, he's carrying a paintball gun around in his hand. That seemed a little odd, we said to each other. The fire had started to die down, so we could not see our campsite very well. At this point, we had probably been gone for almost an hour. From the distance, it looked like Isaac was looking for something. He kept walking around the site and was peering in the tent. When we were almost back to the campsite, we saw Isaac walk up the road we came in on. We figured that he was going to do, we figured that he was going to use the bathroom and did not want to wander through the woods like us. When we got back, we sat next to the fire and waited for Isaac to come back. All of a sudden, we see him lurch out of the tent. He stumbles a few feet and vomits. After we left, we had a few more rum and cokes. We asked him why he kept wandering around the campsite with the paintball gun. Danny gets a strange look on his face. They are locked up in the cab of the truck. Did you unlock it? We go and check the truck, enter the door code, and see all our paintball equipment just as we left it before. The keys to the truck were still hitting in a magnetic fob underneath. I get a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. Isaac, what were you doing after we left? I asked. Um, I was watching a movie on my phone, then I fell asleep, I guess. But you were walking around with your paintball gun, right? Did you just change jackets? Isaac said he had been in the tents since we left, and that he had been wearing the same unhooded fleece all night. Someone had been walking around our campsite, and it wasn't Isaac. At this point, all of us were way too drunk to drive, but we decided to go ahead and pack up and go back to my house for the night. We don't bother packing up the tent. We just fold it down with the sleeping bags and everything in it. We jump in the F-150 and start to drive out. When we get to the dirt hump, we see something gray blocking our path. The metal barrier that had been lying in the woods earlier is now back on its stand, right on top of the hump earlier. By this point, all of us have sobered up to the situation. No one wants to get out of the car and try to move the barrier. I had a metal guard I had a metal guard on the front of the F-150, so I drive forward slowly, tapping the metal barrier with the front of my truck. It falls right off, and we drive over it slowly. We were terrified that it would pop one of our truck tires, but it did not. As we drive down the road, we see a vehicle following us with its lights off. It's probably a thousand feet behind us, but we keep catching glimpses of it as the moon reflects the light off of it. I start to drive as fast as I can on the Forest Service Road, and the other vehicle keeps its pace. It doesn't get any closer though. It stays just one or two turns behind us. 
We can only see it when the road straightens out. After about 45 minutes of speeding along gravel roads, we make it to the back of the main paved road. I start to drive everyone back to my house, but I decide to go a different way just to be safe. I did not get pulled over for a DUI, luckily. Camping can be fun, but very rural camping can be dangerous. I have driven past that metal barrier since that time, but it's always been in place. I would never go down that road again, though. I live in a village in the middle of an English countryside. To paint a picture of its actual size, it has a population of 4,000 but feels more like a thousand due to its spread out nature and being surrounded on all sides by lots of fields, farms, and woods that eventually connects onto a pretty famous forest that's kinda in the middle of nowhere and because of this has notoriously bad phone and internet connections. Having lived here all of my life, I know the place like the back of my hand. I know where all of the public footpaths through the woods and fields are, where they connect, which are shortcuts, which are closed at deep streams, etc. I have gone on walks in this area throughout my childhood with my parents and alone as an adult. Nothing bad has happened. I felt safe here. This story takes place last summer in July. After I moved back home from university, had yet to get a job and smoked a lot of weed, a habit my parents despised and which I tried to keep hidden from them by going for evening walks, multiple pre-rolled joints hidden away in my hoodie pocket. As usual this day, they both got home at 5 p.m. We had dinner, but chatted for a while longer than usual as my mom had had quite a hectic day and was telling me about it. Because of this, I ended up heading out for a walk an hour later than routine around 7 p.m. But as it was summer, the sun was still shining, so honestly I did not really notice that it would start getting dark while I was still out. The woodland closest to my house is less than five minutes away and you enter through a gate into a farmer's field. You can see across the open area quite far until the first set of small woods obscures your view. That's where I was headed as I knew this track takes under two hours and leads back onto the same path I was standing on now more than enough time to smoke the three joints in my pocket and for the smell to leave my clothing I had thought this entire area is very popular for dog walkers so it's not unusual to see people while you are about and as this is a village everybody says hello to everybody I lit my first joint and started walking I'm just in my own world for a while until I was less than a hundred feet before the entrance to the woods. An elderly man was coming out of them throwing a ball for his collie dog. I finished my joint and stumbled out. As I got closer, I recognized it was John who lived on the road next to mine and knew my grandpa. We stopped and said hello as I stroked his dog, Max. While talking, I see another man coming out of the woods, no dog bright green jacket, very tall and head, a good 10 years on me age-wise. Me and John chat another minute and say goodbye. He warns me not to stay out here too long as it will start getting dark soon. True, the sky was bright pink and orange. The sun was indeed beginning to set. I hadn't noticed. I continued on down the path towards the man. When we were nearly passing each other, I look up to make brief eye contact, smile, and say hello like everyone does. Even if you don't recognize the person, my eyes instantly met his. He was already looking at me, his dark eyes locked on mine. He wasn't smiling. I did not know him at all, but I knew something was wrong. It was in his eyes. I swallowed my politeness and looked at the ground as we passed. I lived in my university's city the past couple of years, so I knew a red flag when I saw one. In my country, bunk and manners evaporated, evaporated. I quickened my pace a little before entering the woods, slyly looked back. The man was still walking in the same direction. Following John, I felt relieved, laughed, and cursed 
the weed for making me paranoid while lighting up another joint and started walking into the woods. It takes about 30 minutes to follow the path through the woods to the end. The pathway exit opened into another field that led to another set of woods. The sky was now violet, the dimming light having been obscured to me by the trees. I was already smoking my last joint and was near the entrance to the second set of woods when I felt it. Fear, complete crippling, absolute fear, worked its way like electric through every layer of flesh. I'd never felt anything like it before or since, but I knew what it was. I whipped around standing at the exit of the first set of woods was the man. I could still make out his green jacket in the fading light. He's doubled back, and very quickly too. I looked back several times while in those trees and he hadn't been there. For a second I froze, as did he. He knew I had seen him. To sprint the distance between us would take another five minutes. He was obviously in good shape. I threw the spliff and bolted into the woods, the only way I could go. I did not dare look behind me. I sprinted for a couple of minutes before taking a sharp left turn off the path into the trees, hoping to throw him off a bit, but I could not see a thing. The light was already darkened, and the trees made it a hundred times worse, especially as I was now in the thick of them. These branches catching on my clothes like fingers whipping and scratching my bare legs so bad I bled. I ran and ran, my lungs protesting in pain hating me for smoking so much, while my heart was throwing itself against my rib cage, trying to escape. I threw myself on the ground behind a partly thick trunk, my back against it, knees to my chest, head thrown over my mouth to stifle my labored breathing, desperately trying to bump air into my lungs for the next sprint. I listened for the first time, a few seconds pass slightly, then I hear him, heavy footfall, snapping twigs behind me, and about twenty feet to the left, I dare not look in case he sees me. I have my phone, but now I have little chance of signal being where I am, and now he'd either hear me talking or see the light from the display. I'm not ashamed to say at this point I start to cry, the tears falling slightly down my cheeks. What the hell? I hear a deep voice exclaim, where are you? I know you were here, I saw you. I have to clap both hands across my mouth to stop my scream escaping. I hear him moving around. I panic and I find enough courage to slowly peek from behind the tree. He was about 10 feet behind me, less than 20 feet to the left, with his back to me. I move back and my eyes search the area around me. I pick up a pretty heavy rock. I carefully check on him again. His back is still turned and he's searching through the trees hunched down lower to the ground now. I make a snap decision and with everything I had, I threw the rock behind me to the right. It clattered through the branches of the trees and made one hell of a noise. I watched him immediately bolt in its direction laughing. He laughed. I paused a little hearing his footsteps get quieter although I thought I would not be so visible to him if I moved and threw myself forward. I ran trying to put as much distance between us as possible, but I was also aware that I was getting further and further away from home. I knew there had been a stream somewhere close. If I found the stream, I could follow it as it borders the land and ran parallel to some of the footpaths. I ran and ran and ran until the trees finally cleared, and I could just make out another field through them to the other side. I thank God and push myself a little bit further till I'm out of the trees and the ground disappears from below my feet and I go head over shoulders down the stream embankment. I crash into the water below, my open mouth and lungs filling with muddy water. As I splutter it out, I feel both relieved to have found the stream and terrified he's hurt me. My phone is now ruined. I slowly make my way downstream as quiet as possible, listening out for him the whole time as the stream borders the woods, looking up periodically just in case. After a while, maybe, 
Half an hour, I noticed the trees begin to thin out and realized this is the edge of the woods where I would have been exiting and where the path connected to the original one I'd started on. If I ran, I could get home in less than 20 minutes. As quiet as I could, I dragged myself on my stomach back up the embankment army style, wanting to stay as low as possible. A loud yell came from across the field. I swear my legs nearly gave out then and there. He had been waiting for me. I turned my head and saw him sprinting out of the woods at full pelt. I ran and ran, pushing myself up, pushing myself up and over the gate and ran up the road. I dared look as I made the turning for the road. He was still following me. I raced up my driveway and threw myself through the door, running into the living room, crying and screaming hysterically, pointing behind me towards the door. My dad ran outside while my mom grabbed a hold of me as I clapped, shaking. As it turns out, my parents had already called the police. As I said, I was going out for an hour or so at 7, and it was now past 12 a.m., and I hadn't answered when they had called my now broken phone. Very unlike me. We called the police again to explain. They came, and I gave a full statement. Both my parents and the police were horrified. Nothing like this happens here. There hasn't been a reported rape or murder in the last 100 years. But one look at me and it was obvious I was telling the truth. I was covered head to toes in cuts and bruises soaking wet and covered in mud and blood. I won't go into how this experience changed me, it's depressing. But I will say the thing that scares me the most is that they never even had a suspect despite him following me so closely. He was gone by the time my dad ran outside. The guy is still out there and who knows what he is actually capable of. I was recruited by an agency when I was in college around the age of 19. I never had an interest in it prior to the agency offer, so I was an industry novice but accepted the opportunity due to the earning potential. I have since retired from the industry and seriously wised up. When I first began, all of my photo shoots, fashion shows, and promo events were coordinated through my agency, I will admit. I was naive at the time and had little to no background on the industry. About three months after signing with my agency, I got contacted on my personal email from a photographer who was interested in booking me for a shot. It was odd as I did not have social media or have my personal email and my phone number posted online for potential booking agents. However, I shrugged it off. Everything up until the point was all agency based. The photographer was interested in building his portfolio and was offering $100 an hour for a high fashion nature shoot. I was new myself and also looking to build my portfolio and make some extra money for only two hours of work. Because of that, I agreed to book the shot without knowledge of my agency. As I did not want to sacrifice the 15% agency fee that they'd take. The shoot was scheduled at a nature reserve about 30 minutes from my university due to the nature of the shoot. The photographer was able to provide wardrobe but not hair and makeup services. I was sent images of the wardrobe beforehand and approved based on the modesty of the apparel. When I arrived at the shoot, the photographer met me to show me the location he wanted to shoot at. No immediate red flags went off because it was more scenic off of the trails. His camera wardrobe bag and a few reflectors were brought along with us. I followed the photographer into the woods and the further we trekked off the trails, the more nervous I became about 20 minutes into our trek through the woods. The photographer decided to set up camp at a woodsy remote location. He took out the wardrobes and expected me to change right there in front of him. The wardrobe looked nothing like the photos he had sent me. This hardcore bondage apparel, in addition to this, his behavior was odd. I could not exactly identify what it was about him that made me feel uneasy, but my gut was telling me that something wasn't right. The first red flag was the absence of his assistant and how unprofessional he seemed. 
After about 10 minutes of arguing about changing in front of him, he finally gave in and walked deeper into the forest to let me change. I honestly had no intentions of shooting in that attire, but I needed to get him to leave due to the aggressive tone he began taking. I heard him cussing and grunting under his breath as he walked a ways into the woods to give me privacy. At that point, I left with haste, dropped the money and wardrobe, and ran through the woods to my car. When I finally made it to my car, I could hear him running and yelling at me. I tore ass out of the nature reserve and did not look back. About 10 minutes later, I got a text that consisted of a number of nonsensical numeric characters and one that simply said LOL. When I got home, I saw one final text from him. He told me that I was missing out on a good time and that he was planning on having a good time with me in more ways than one. I called my service provider to have his number blocked immediately. I received approximately 20 emails from him about one month after the incident. I did not open them and sent them straight to my trash can. So after he completely removed all of his profiles from industry websites, I'm truly hoping that nobody had an experience like the one I had with him and further, I'm truly hoping that he did not harm any other model who worked for him. I certainly learned my lesson after that and have since gained an incredible sense of personal institution. This happened in 1971 or 1972 when my mother was about 14 or 15 years old. The incident occurred in a heavily wooded area near by Montefalo, Alabama, close to Birmingham. My mother is the oldest of five children. She has three sisters and a brother who is the baby of the family. One weekend in the cool months of the fall, my grandfather decided to take the whole family, my grandmother, my mother, and all of my aunts and uncles, so seven people total, into the woods for target practice with a rifle. My mother grew up quite poor, and they didn't always live in the best neighborhoods, so my grandfather wanted to teach the kids how to defend themselves with a rifle if need be. Like I said, it was later in the fall, so the trees were bare and there were lots of leaves on the ground. The wooded area was just off a dirt road, so there was a fairly rural area they were in. Since it was so far off the beaten path, my grandfather became startled when he heard the roar of a car engine so deep in the woods my mom remembers the car as being a blue Ford Galaxy. Despite the fact that my grandfather had a gun, he totally freaked out and told my grandma and the kids to hide under a pile of leaves in the woods. The man in the driver's seat got out, dragged a woman's body out of the car, and just dumped her there in the woods and drove away. After my grandfather was sure that the man had gone, everyone came out of hiding, and the woman sat up and stared them straight in the face. My grandfather asked the woman if she needed help. She said no, she would be fine. She didn't seem to be injured and obviously didn't want help. She hadn't put up a fight with the man when he was dragging her out of the car. So my grandfather cut the shooting lesson short and decided to rush the kids home to safety while on the trail back to the dirt road where my grandfather had parked their car. They passed the man in the blue Ford Galaxy driving out of the woods. My mom looked over and noticed that he had a huge machete laying across the front seats right beside him. My grandfather made sure that the man could see that he was carrying a rifle, but everyone was careful not to give away what they had just seen. The man struck up a small talk with my grandfather, asked him how he was doing and what they were doing out in the woods. My grandfather explained that he had just taken his family out for target practice with the rifle. The man told him to have a nice day and continued driving. The next day my grandfather went back out to the spot in the woods. There was not a body there. However, he did find the woman's wig, her purse, some Kleenex, and a pair of eyeglasses. He collected the items and took them home. According to my grandfather, the area of the woods was known for having shallow graves and being a dumping site for bodies. My mother became hysterical when he walked in the door carrying that stuff. 
she started screaming, he killed that lady, he killed that lady. My grandfather ended up taking the items to the police station, but my mom doesn't think anything ever came of it. She never heard anything else about it after that. Well, she did hear one thing about it. I guess earlier the next morning, my grandmother called my mom when she arrived at work. Just before the kids left for school, she told them not to take the bus that day, that she would come and pick them up and drive them to school. When my mom asked why, my grandmother said, because the car is waiting for you at the bus stop. <laughs>